Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church for worship today. Whether you are a lifelong member or a first-time visitor, whether you are here in the sanctuary or worshiping online, we are glad that you are here, and you are most welcome. For those of you here in the sanctuary, I'd like to remind you and invite you to find the friendship pad on one side of your pew. If you will pick that up and sign your name and pass it along, that way we will all get to know one another's names and hopefully no one will leave here a stranger today especially if you are a first-time visitor we'd love it if you would leave a way to reach out to you a phone number or an email so that we might connect with you later this week there's a lot happening in the life of our community this week i encourage you to take some time today to read through all of the announcements in your bulletin and i will highlight a couple for you First, there are still a few volunteer spots for our Vacation Bible School this summer in June. If you have never experienced that event with us, I encourage you to take a look at that sign up and see if you can come join us for a fun celebration. This afternoon, the York County Choral Society has a performance at 4 o'clock right here in this sanctuary. And so if you want an afternoon of some wonderful music, I encourage you to come back information about how to purchase tickets is in the announcement in the bulletin and speaking of music and singing all boys and men are invited to be a part of a special men's chorus on mother's day sunday may 14th coming up in a few weeks and if you're interested in being a part of that chorus there is no need to sign up there is nothing to do ahead of time other than show up that day You can come at 8.15 if you want to participate in the early service, or come at 10.30 if you want to participate in the 11 o'clock service, and you just meet down in the choir room. So we hope that you will be a part of that joyful noise as we celebrate that Sunday. And I want to share a word of thanks this morning for Reverend Steve Simon. He is here with us and a part of our the life of unity here in our congregation, but he is sharing worship leadership with us, and I'm grateful you are here. Thank you, Steve. Today in our service, we will have a special celebration with the women of unity, and to tell us a little bit more about that, I'd like to invite the moderator for Women of Unity up here to share a minute for mission with us, Karen Fuquay. Good morning. I am honored to come before you to give a minute for mission on the women's ministry here at Unity Presbyterian Church. Women of Unity is a Presbyterian women's organization and it provides opportunities for women to come together, to love and support one another, for study and prayer, and to give and serve. Women of Unity has a variety of small groups and circles for Bible study, book study, service projects, and fellowship. Beginning in September, there will be weekly, monthly, and every other month opportunities for all women. There are many organizations Women of Unity sponsors and supports. Some of these include the Fort Mill Care Center, York County Council on Aging, the Children's Attention Home, Historic Paradise Foundation, and Family Promise. Women of Unity also provides support to the Unity Preschool and the Pastor Discretionary Fund. We support Presbyterian Women USA efforts as well. As a part of our offering this morning, you'll have an opportunity to support the National Presbyterian Women's Birthday Offering. For over a hundred years, Presbyterian women have given to this offering and have helped provide transformative grants throughout the world. More information regarding the offering can be found in your bulletin. Women of Unity sponsors many events during the year. One of those is the Women's Spiritual Retreat, this year held in Montreat, September 15th through the 17th. The retreat will be led by Reverend Julie Hester, and the theme is sharing our stories. The retreat will include group sessions, a variety of breakout sessions, and a special closing worship on Sunday. Registration opens June 1st. 
There will be representatives from Women of Unity's coordinating team in the narthex following worship to answer any questions you may have. Our Women of Unity webpage has been updated recently on the church's website to provide information about all that Women of Unity offers. There are many ways to become involved. You can sign up to receive communications today or on the website. In closing, Women of Unity is a ministry for all women. If today is your first time here, we're delighted that, you have, that you're here. Know that there's a place for you with Women of Unity. Maybe you've been coming to Unity for some time, but have not yet become involved in women's ministry. There's a place for you at Women of Unity. Perhaps you've been a member for many years, and at one time were a part of our women's ministry, but are not today. There's a place for you with Women of Unity. For those of you who have supported the ministry year after year, on behalf of the coordinating team, we thank you. God's blessing and your support make Women of Unity a thriving ministry. Thank you. Good morning. Will those who are able please stand and join me in the call to worship. Our good shepherd calls. He knows us each by name. Our good shepherd leads. We are here to listen and to follow. Our good shepherd protects and provides. We give thanks and praise for our good shepherd. Thank you.
please be seated. God is gracious and merciful and knows our needs even before we are able to speak them ourselves. Still, we come to this font and we practice confession, admitting to God all that rests uneasily on our hearts. So confident in God's love this morning, let us make our confession together, first out loud and then silently. Let us pray. Savior God, you beckon us, but we do not heed your call. You gather us, but we wander away, losing ourselves in false and superficial comforts. You speak truth, but we fail to hear and respond. Good Shepherd, do not give up on us. Redeem us, restore us, resurrect us for life in Christ. Amen. Even when we walk through the darkest valley, God is with us. God does not abandon us. Know that you are forgiven and receive Christ's peace. Alleluia. Amen. Good morning. Each year, the Women of Unity nominate and select an extraordinary woman to receive the Presbyterian Women's Honorary Life Membership Award. This is a national honor originating in 1912 from the Presbyterian Women in the Presbyterian Church USA. It recognizes women that are known for their commitment to Christ and the mission of the church. This award honors the woman who has given of herself over her lifetime, devoted service to her church and community, a woman who has impacted the lives of many through her love, generosity, and actions. At this time, I would like to invite all past participants, recipients of the Presbyterian Women Honorary Life Membership Award present to come forward and stand with me as we prepare to announce this year's recipient. On behalf of the Women of Unity, I am honored to announce the Presbyterian Women Honorary Life Membership Award for 2023 is Susan Mobley. Susan Mobley is a well-known and respected woman of our church. 
Her nominations included statements such as, when I think of service to God and service to our church, I think of Susan Mobley. Susan has been acting like a Stephen minister even before Unity had them. Susan can put those who have recently lost a loved one at such calm. She has served many who are going through a difficult time with such care and grace. Susan is a kind, humble servant of God. Susan has a compassionate heart, offering love, prayer, and support to countless individuals. She listens to understand, not simply to hear. Time spent with Susan is a blessing indeed. In her more than 33 years as a member of Unity Presbyterian Church, Susan serves or has served in many roles. Elder, deacon, Stephen leader, and Stephen minister. She was instrumental in bringing Stephen ministry to unity. It was an effort years in the making and has in, impacted the lives of many. Congregational care, Sunday school teacher, hospital and homebound visitor, centering prayer small group leader. She serves on the health ministry team. She serves on the Women of Unity's retreat team, and she's a member of the Tony Daler Circle. Susan's service to others extends well beyond the walls of our church to include a nursing career spanning over 40 years to include dedicated service as a parish and a hospice nurse. She has led and participated in medical mission trips for over seven years to Haiti, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. She has served as a youth group advisor for over 10 years with junior and senior high school students. She has chaired and served on a hospice ethics committee. Susan is a devoted wife, mother, and cherished grandmother. She is a blessing to many and dearly loved. God calls us to love one another as he first loved us. Susan's gentle, loving spirit in serving others is an example to us all. Congratulations, Susan, for who you are and all that you do. Let us share a word of prayer for this wonderful moment. Let us pray. O holy creator, mother and father of us all, we thank you for women of faith, for Ruth and Rahab, for Tamar and Sarah, for Martha and Mary, and for all the women whose names we know in our own lives, women who are brave and courageous, who are steadfast and compassionate, women who inspire us. We celebrate with gratitude today, Susan Mobley. We are grateful for her presence here and for all the gifts she has shared with this community. Her wisdom, her patient, nurturing presence, her determination to help those in need, her sense of humor, her unending compassion, and most of all, her faith in you. We pause today to say thank you for Susan and thank you for all the ways in which all of the women of Unity help our entire community follow you more faithfully. We ask you to continue to pour out your love and support for Susan and for all of us gathered here this day and all days. Amen. As they are finding their seats, we will continue with the reading and hearing of the word. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Songbook of Israel, the Psalms, 
Let us hear the word of God from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I'd like to invite the children who are gathered here with us today to come forward and share a special word with me here on the carpet. And if you are worshiping with us online and want to scoot a little closer to your screens, we'd love for you to share this word as well. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Pretty good? Good, I hope so. Come on down, Quinn. I'm so glad that you all are here. Every time you all come to worship, you make it better. So thank you for being here today. Well, I don't know. Sometimes we, we catch other people at the early service too. There's a lot of people at the early service. Um, so this morning, I wanted to ask you all, do you all have any pets at home? No. Raise your hand if you have a pet. Have you ever been to the zoo? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes we have pets at home. Sometimes we go to see wonderful animals at the zoo where they're being taken care of. And, or an aquarium. Oh, we love the aquarium. I think it's a Georgia. That one's my favorite. Yeah. So whether animals are at our home or whether they're somewhere else that we try to take care of them, Animals need a lot of care, right? What are some things that animals need when they're being taken care of? Food, Food. yeah. Water. Water, yeah, what else? Oxygen, Oxygen. yep. <laughs> a habitat, right, they need a space, right? Well, what else? That's all right, you, we can come back if you think of it. So they also need, right, some exercise, right? They need a place to, to move around and to, to do what they need to do. So there's a lot of things sometimes that we do to take care of our animals. I know for our house, we have a dog. So we let him in and out and back in and back out again lots of times. So our animals need a lot of care and nurture. We're going to read a scripture passage today. And you know what that scripture passage says? It says we need a lot of care and nurture too. And you know who knows what we need? Jesus Christ. Jesus knows what we need sometimes before we do. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get really tired and I don't realize how tired I am. And someone will say, well, why don't you take a nap? Or why don't you rest for a little while? And that is, that is a voice telling me what I need when I don't recognize it. And our passage today tells us that Jesus knows everything we need. He knows when you're tired and you need to rest. He knows when you need more water, when you need some food, when you need a friend or a family member to comfort you if you're not feeling good. He knows exactly what we need. And that's something that we can go forward knowing that will give us comfort, even when we can't figure out hard situations. All right? So will you remember that with me? Awesome. Well, why don't we pray before we go? Will you repeat after me? All right, let's pray. Holy God. Holy God. Thank you for caring for us. And knowing our needs before we do. Before we do. Help, us Help us to accept your love, to accept your love. This, day and every day. this day and every day. Amen. 
Amen. All right. Thank you all for being here. You can head to Children in Worship or back to sit with your families as we surround you with our blessing. Today is the fourth Sunday of Easter. It's the midpoint of the Easter season. It's kind of a moment of transition between the stories in Acts that we've been reading about those post-resurrection encounters with Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This Sunday is also known as the Good Shepherd Sunday, and many congregations that follow the lectionary We'll be focusing on the image as Christ as the shepherd today. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 10. And while this text does include Jesus as shepherd, it also includes him as the gate to the sheep pen. And this part of John picks up in the midst of an unfolding drama. In chapter 9, right before this, Jesus uses mud and spit to heal a blind man on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees had heard about it and came to investigate. They question the man who had been blind. They interrogate his parents. And at the end of the day, they just can't figure out who this Jesus is, what he's doing, and how he's able to heal this man and to do it on the Sabbath. So they drive the man who has been healed out of the synagogue. Jesus hears about this and goes to speak directly to the Pharisees, telling them that they are the ones who are blind. They cannot see that the Son of God is right in front of their faces. So chapter 10 picks up in the midst of that conversation. So let's listen now for the word of the Lord. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we are in all of you in the way you guide us to what we need. Guide us today as we listen for your word and seek to understand and to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am the gate. When most people hear the word gate in relationship to religion, they probably think about some pearly white gates floating up on a cloud with St. Peter perched in front of it with his halo. I know I saw a lot of that growing up reading the comic strips in the newspaper. But gates are more than that. Gates are everywhere. 
and they come in many shapes and sizes. From the baby gate that keeps our toddlers from crawling up flights of stairs, to the iron gates in front of magnificent palaces in Europe, to the gates with barbed wire that surround our prisons. Gates serve a lot of purposes, both physically and symbolically. A favorite gate to some people in this region of the world, at least to a lot of Presbyterians, is the gate that sits at the entrance of the town of Montreat. The gate is this large stone structure with two arches that stretch over the road that leads in and out of the town. It's a bit narrow, but a regular size car fits through, all right. And growing up, my youth group started this tradition. Every time we went up to the youth conference and we passed under that gate, we would roll the windows down and we would reach out and touch the stones with our hands. It was a wonderful tradition, except for the one year we forgot to tell the new chaperone driving about it and startled him a great bit as he was trying to avoid hitting the gate and all of a sudden had multiple teenagers hanging out of all the windows of the vehicle. But truly, touching those stones at the Montreat Gate became an important ritual for us. We knew that passing through those sturdy archways meant that we were in a special place. We were leaving behind the stress of school and the struggles of fitting in, and we were arriving at a safe space to be who we were as our most authentic selves. That gateway became for us, as I suspect it is for many people who pass through it, a liminal space a space that marked the transition to and from holy ground. Gates are powerful in that way. They have the power to protect or the power to provide privilege. They are placed on thresholds and they swing open and closed to welcome people in or to keep people out. One scholar shares these thoughts about gates. Gates bring to mind something that separates those on the inside from those on the outside. And for 2,000 years, the church's proclamation of Jesus as the gate has served both purposes. For John's community, those who entered by the gate that was Christ had to close the gate on the flock that remained in the synagogue. And on both sides, questions of exclusion and inclusion raged who was in and who was out, theologically, morally, ethically? Friends, this scholar is right. For 2,000 years, the church has argued these questions and set rules about who might be on what side of the gate. But to limit Jesus to a simple dividing barrier is to miss the profound promise of abundant life that he's offering. Listen to verses 9 and 10 again. I am the gate for the sheep. The ones who enter by me will be safe and well cared for. Following the shepherd, they will go in and out and find good food to eat. Thieves enter only to take life away, to steal what is not theirs, and to bring ruin to all they cannot have. I have come to give the good life, a life that overflows with beauty and harmony. These words are a little bit different than the NRSV translation I first read. These are from the First Nations Version, an indigenous translation of the New Testament. And I love the language here, They will go in and out as needed for a life of beauty and harmony. Jesus, as the gate, welcomes the sheep in and then keeps things out that might seek to harm them. And when needed, Jesus sends the sheep back out to pasture to receive the nourishment that they need. 
The emphasis here is on the movement. The gate opens and closes when it is best for the sheep. First to come in and find rest and protection, and then to go out again when it is time to eat and drink. Sheep would not thrive or even survive if they were kept in their fence all the time, nor would they feel they had a safe place to rest and recuperate if they had no pen to retreat to after wandering the countryside. Sheep need both provision and protection, and the gate is the doorway to receiving both of those things. The First Nations version uses this language for verses 3 and 4. The gatekeeper opens the way. The sheep know their shepherd's voice, for he calls each one by name, and they follow him as he leads them in and out of the sheep pen. Friends, we are the sheep in this story. We need protection and provision. We need care and nurture. We need guidance and grace. And sometimes we need a boot out the door. Christ knows exactly what we need and when we need it. The gate isn't there to keep people in or out in a perpetual separation. The gate is there to guide all those who are seeking the abundant life promised through Christ Jesus. The gate is that liminal, transitional space that allows us to follow where Christ is leading us. It's like the gate at Montreat. We move in and out when we need to. We go into the gate to attend conferences and retreats, looking for rest and spiritual renewal. And after we've spent time exploring our faith and hearing the stories of our neighbors there, we go back out again. We go down the mountain and into the world and back to our schools and our jobs and our neighborhoods. We are not meant to stay on the mountain forever, nor are we meant to toil in the world without rest and care. This is the same pattern of movement that draws us into worship here each week. The bell rings and the shepherd calls us by name into the doors of this building and we gather here to be renewed, to be cared for. Then with a charge and a blessing, we are sent back out into the community to work and live and play. The gate is the space that allows us to move back and forth between the pen and the pasture between the protected safe space and the place we go out to find food and light. Because Jesus knows just what we need, and he provides more than we could ever need. Looking at the other ways that Jesus has revealed himself to us in this gospel, we can see that to be true. In chapter 4, he says that he is the living water. In chapter 6, he is the bread of life. In chapter 9, he is the light of the world. Water, bread, light, all elements essential for living. And now Jesus says, I am the gate. The gate is the way we get the water and the bread and the light over and over again. The light allows us to follow the Good Shepherd to all the things we need for living. And not just surviving or getting by, living with abundance. The psalmist knows this to be true. As we heard his words earlier, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. Beloved, the gate is not about who's in and who's out. It's not about which side of the gate we think we're on. 
It's about being at the threshold of God's promises for our lives, hearing the familiar voice of the shepherd, and then being willing to follow that voice. The gate is about trusting the shepherd who has our very best interest at heart. And the gate is about allowing ourselves to be open to the revelation of God and Jesus Christ, wherever that might lead us. So today, as sheep, our task is to sit with the idea of these gates for a while. What do the gates in your life look like right now? Which gates are coming to a close to offer you protection and rest where you need it most? Which gates are opening to allow some fresh air and light and water and nourishment? I bet we can all identify a few gates in our life. Those places that transition us onto holy ground where we can listen for the distinct call of the shepherd who knows us best of all, who calls us by name and is showing us the way. May we have the courage to follow and trust in that promise of abundant life through Christ. May it be so. Let us pray. Holy God, we believe. Help our unbelief. We love you. Help us to love you more. Amen. Friends, having heard the word of God read and proclaimed, I invite you now to stand if you're able, and let's join together in affirming what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that are printed in the, in the bulletin for us. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And let us look together to the Lord in prayer. O holy and awesome God, we come to you today, this day with gratitude. Here in this Easter season, we're especially mindful of the new life that you've given us through the death and resurrection of your Son. As we watch flowers blooming and the springtime bringing new life of all kinds, we celebrate the abundant life that is ours in Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that you've called us to be your people and thankful for all of the love, grace, and peace that you've poured into our hearts. But almighty and compassionate God, we come before you knowing that our world is still filled with so much darkness and evil, so much pain and suffering, so much fear and despair. The forces that put Jesus on the cross are still very much at work in the lives of so many people all around us, including many of us right here in this sanctuary, were gathered with us online. That Easter proclaims your victory over death and darkness and evil. And so, loving God, in the power of the resurrection, we turn to you, asking for your life-giving spirit to minister to those in need this day and always. We pray for the homeless and the refugees, for prisoners and oppressed people all around the world, for abused children, battered women, victims of crimes or racism and prejudice. We pray for the unemployed and those who are struggling with financial needs. We lift up before you those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, those who are fighting addictions, depression, 
mental illnesses, as well as those who face chronic illness or pain and other health issues. And we pray also for those family members and friends and other individuals who are especially on our minds this morning. And finally, gracious God, we pray for ourselves and ask that we might be encouraged and strengthened by your life-giving spirit. May you enable us to live in the hope and joy of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when praying to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, one of the ways that we respond to God's work in our lives and in the world is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, This is a a tangible way for us to tell God thank you. Thank you for, for being our God and for calling us to be his people. As we, as we give God our gifts, we're giving him our heart and our life as well in renewed commitment. So I invite you now to give joyfully and, and generously to our, our great and, and loving God. And you can do that as the offering plates get passed here in the, in the sanctuary, in donation boxes as you leave here. You can use the QR code that's printed in the worship orders, or you can give online uh, through our uh, church website. But let us bless God now with our gifts.
merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, our lives, our time, and our possessions, all signs of your gracious love. So, we receive, so receive these gifts now for the sake of the one who gave himself for us, our Lord Jesus Christ. And bless these gifts that they might advance the work of your kingdom. For we pray this in the name of our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. go out. The Women of Unity were hosting lemonade on the lawn. Has that been moved indoors somewhere? Fellowship Hall? Okay. There is lemonade on, in, on the lawn in the Fellowship Hall since it is raining outside. I wanted to make sure to remind you all to come and join us there. 
But as we go out, we are reminded that we have been drawn in by a shepherd who knows what we need and sends us out again when we need that. So let us have the courage to follow. And remember, as you go from this place, the life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So what shall we do? Let us make haste to be kind and be swift to love that God's light and love and justice and joy might be for you and for all people everywhere. Amen. Amen.